Well, thank you for that introduction. It's pretty much as I wrote it, really. <laughs> um, we live in a world where tonight a billion people will go to bed hungry. They literally do not have enough calories, and if they're parents who haven't been able to feed their children, they feel a moral failure. Some 21,000 children under the age of five will die today because they can't get enough calories. We here have all the necessities of life and a lot more besides. We have shelter and, of course, enough food, too many calories. And yet, we have a different hunger. Not hunger of the body, hunger of the mind and the soul. That hunger is just as addictive. It's a hunger literally for more stuff. And we know that more stuff is always a new brand and a faster gadget and some other symbol of status or a trinket. And we always, though we know we don't need it, find ourselves hungering for it. Consumer hunger is quite extraordinary. It's the paradox that the more you have, you don't stop, you want more. Unlike the Snickers ad, it never really satisfies. And even like Betty White, you can be crunched by this consumer hunger. So advertising essentially is feeding the beast of this hunger. It is explaining a message that you should be dissatisfied with your life. Your body weight is not right. Whose ever is. There aren't enough brand labels in your cupboard. You won't look right if you don't have this, uh, this product. You won't be efficient and smart if you don't buy this. It's a doctrine, an iron law of more stuff. And it absolutely plays on our feelings of inadequacy and insecurity. We have a deficit which can be filled with more stuff. It plays on our competitive streaks. We will actually be ahead of others. I mean, we don't just talk about young people here. My generation, we're concerned about the postcode where our house is and the school and the brand name that we're sending our kids to and the car we drive. This is an iron law. And if we're just bored or lonely, it plays on our distraction needs. So more stuff and brilliant marketing by advertisers is a secular religion that has been elevated into almost a religious status. Have you noticed that our shopping malls are built like large temples? There's huge car parks, uh, there's extended worshipping hours now, and when you go in there's often Muzak playing, just like when you go into a religious church or a temple, and it's soothing. You have had preached what in religious terms is called the doctrine of sin. You have failed. You haven't lived up to the mark. There is something missing in your life. And you've internalised that message. And in the shopping temple, when you go in, you have also just started to believe in the doctrine of salvation. Simply, that says, we can meet what's missing in your life. We can overcome that failure. There is something that will compensate for what you're feeling, your insecurity, your competitive streak that hasn't been, hasn't been met. I'm fascinated that when you go up to shop assistants, they're like priests or ministers, standing almost with sacraments, and they say, touch, try on, handle. And when you try it on and you come back, they give you a blessing, they say, Wow, you look fantastic in that. That's made all the difference. You start to go, it's true. I've found what's missing. This doctrine of sin. This is salvation. And then you hand over your money, just like you do in church when the plate goes around. And that priest shopping assistant gives you the universal blessing. They say, have a nice day. And you walk out thinking, it's true. I have found what was missing in my life. Until, of course, with the appetite that's never satisfied, again, the dissatisfaction steps in. Well, it's virtually hard watching TV today to tell the televangelists from home shopping, certainly in the small hours when they're interchangeably programmed. Here is almost a religion of more stuff going on. 
I think there's a better way. In my travels with World Vision, I go to a place uh, called Nagaland in East India, uh, northeast India. The Nagas are tribal, 40 different tribal groups. They're high up in the mountains, it's cold. They weave these magnificent full-length coats with beautiful tapestry, and each colour of a coat has a certain status in Naga culture. If you're wearing a red coat, you're a lawgiver. If you're wearing a blue coat, you're a teacher. And it goes down the line. Every now and then, as you go through Naga villages, you see a gold coat. And it's so stunning, you can't help but be knocked out. I said to my Naga guide, gold, what do they do? Who are they? And my Naga guide said, oh, well, that's a person who's given a feast of merit. When I looked puzzled, she said, don't you have feasts of merit in Australia? I said, well, I don't know. Tell me what it is. They said, oh, well, in Naga culture, when you become rich, now that's rich by Naga standards. Every one of us is richer than the richest Naga. It means you've got a number of pigs and a barn full of rice bags. You can then choose to throw a feast of merit. The feast goes for a week, three weeks, five weeks, for however long it takes to throw a feast for the whole village, particularly the poor, the feast goes for however long it takes to liquidate all your assets. When all your pigs are gone, when all your rice is gone, when you've got absolutely nothing, you're given a gold coat and you start again with nothing. I said, I'm pretty sure we don't have this in Australia. <laughs> Well, here is an antidote to the more stuff. It is saying we didn't bring anything with us. We're certainly not taking it when we leave. The whole point of wealth is to make a difference now. For the poor, to celebrate, to party, for relationships. It's incredibly important when we start to think about a big idea to say, I think, to advertisers, here's a big idea. Sell the idea that less is more, that you find your life when you give it away. Buy, sell an idea that you can earn yourself a gold cloak to give your all and all will be yours. I often think about this when I went to a birthday party and I watched the candles blown out. Happy birthday sung, mum whips out the candles, starts cutting up the cake. An American mother was there. She said, it's amazing uh, what you're doing. Why are you doing this? Oh, the Australian mum said it's our tradition. We cut up the cake, each kid gets a piece, they can eat it now, they can take it home. And the American mum said, well, that's not fair. The Australian said, hang on, every kid's getting a piece. It's the same size piece, it couldn't be fairer. She said, well, you haven't asked the kids if they want a piece and what size piece they want. You have just decided for them. Some want, may want no piece, some may want a big piece. Who are you just to decide? I thought, gee, this is like... America's debate around health care. There's a health cake. <laughs> Some people want a big piece and others get none. This is like climate change. Who owns the sky? We want to put up 24 tonnes per capita of carbon and say to the Indians, don't you grow, even though you're only 1.6 tonnes of carbon up there. Who owns it? Who carves it up? Well, the big idea, the simple idea, is earn a gold cloak. Earn a gold cloak by saying, Rather than more stuff, I actually want to see a fair world where a billion people aren't going to bed hungry. That's why the Christmas gift catalogue is sort of subverting the temple of worship at Christmas. What do you buy for loved ones and friends who already have everything? Buy them a goat. Buy them a well. Buy them some chooks so that people who have so little can have their slice of that cake. There's my big idea. Earn yourself a gold cloak. Thank you.